Um, hey everybody, I'm Elaine Ikeda with California Campus Compact, and you are participating in a um, webinar series uh, that we do at California Campus Compact in collaboration with Utah Campus Compact and Campus Compact of the Mountain West. So today's uh, topic is community or political engagement, educating for democracy in troubled times. I am going to go over a little bit of logistics for those of you who may not be familiar with the Zoom platform that you're on. Um, you will be seeing uh, Rick Battistoni's PowerPoint as we go through this. I wanna let you know we're recording this webinar and uh, it will be available after uh, on our YouTube channel and we will be sending you that link uh, in the next 24 hours or so when we also send you an evaluation for you to fill out to, um, to evaluate this webinar. Um, if you put your cursor down towards the bottom of the screen, you will see some um, items show up. Um, you've all been muted so that we don't have to hear uh, phones ringing, other conversations. Um, but if you have any questions at all during the um, during this presentation, you can type them in the Q and A box that you see down there. If you click on that, you can actually ask a question. And at the end of the webinar, we have allocated time for some Q and A with Rick. And so I will be monitoring that Q&A box and I will ask Rick the questions that are in there um, at the end of the webinar. Um, unfortunately, we aren't able to unmute people as they have their questions, so we'll be using that, that box. So just move your cursor down to the bottom, click on the Q&A, and we'll be able to see what questions you type in there. Um, so uh, again, thank you for joining us. I want to um, do a brief introduction of our guest um, presenter, Rick Battistoni. Um, so I have known Rick for a long time, and I thought it'd be fun to just do a Google search and see what came up when I typed in Rick Battistoni. And uh, it turns out that there's a dentist in Oak Park, Illinois, named Rick Battistoni, and the executive director of the Las Vegas Food Services Incorporated is also named Rick Battistoni. I don't know if you knew this, Rick. There's also um, someone who's uh, a partner in an assurance services group in Winnipeg, which is a mid-size uh, agri-food producer. So anyway, all of those are the other, uh, other Rick Battistonis out there in the world. But we're thrilled to have uh, Rick join us today for the webinar. Um, he is the professor of political science and of Public and Community Service Studies and the director of the Feinstein Institute for Public Service at Providence College. He has a long history of being a leader in the field of service learning and civic engagement and has been a longtime partner and supporter of many Campus Compact initiatives. And um, he was a leader in the work on the Engaged Department Institutes which was a strategic initiative of Campus Compacts to embed service learning in various disciplines and support faculty in deepening their practice while also influencing promotion and tenure within the academy. So I've really enjoyed working with them off and on over the years and I'm gonna turn it over to Rick now. And um, again, any questions you have, just type them in the Q&A box um, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Elaine, uh, and I want to thank uh, Campus Compact for uh, making this opportunity available. I'm uh, excited to be visiting with everyone today and uh, laying out a few thoughts and some questions and some provocations and uh, hope that uh, we can get some conversation going, um, some questions at the end. I'm going to um, talk through some slides that I've put together and uh, hopefully they'll raise questions for you and uh, allow you to make challenges, critiques, all of those things. Uh, but uh, this is something that is near and dear to my heart, has been since I've been involved with Campus Compact and so, uh, and uh, in the current context uh, raises some new questions. So very excited to get started. And again, uh, thanks Elaine for the opportunity. I'm going to, 
I hope leave plenty of time for conversation, um, but bear with me and uh, I'll get started. Before I get started, I wanna make uh, clear my opening assumptions. The first is that I think that politics and political engagement matter. Uh, they matter a lot. Uh, I'm a political scientist and a democratic theory, so I think uh, as an as a advocate of democracy with a small d, it matters that people are engaged, but more importantly, it matters that all we need all hands on deck. We have problems and issues that require the voices and ideas and uh, creativity of everyone. And when uh, our students, <clears throat> our current and future uh, resources in our society are not engaged, are not thinking about the public sphere and, and and public policy in those issues, we're losing out. We, we don't have everybody contributing to public problem solving. Um, for our students' own development, it matters because I fully believe that um, you can't be an effective health professional unless you know the public policy and political context for healthcare, healthcare reform, all of those issues. You cannot be an effective educator if you don't understand the public policy and political context uh, of education reform and the way that education uh, is dealt with uh, at the local, national, and international level. And so in order to be effective in one's career, in one's vocation, uh, it matters that you understand the public policy context. So politics matters. Um, and uh, the second assumption is that I still, after all these years, believe that community engagement um, can be, uh, if done well and done intentionally, can be an effective way into politics and political engagement. It's not the only way, it's not the only vehicle, but it is uh, done well, an effective vehicle, and particularly given that a lot of the students that I encounter are so turned off by politics that they wouldn't start there, uh, starting by looking at questions of service and engagement and partnering with community and involving oneself in community can be a vehicle to get students to think about uh, politics, public life and participation in politics. The last thing I'll lead with uh, is uh, that um, I will go back and forth in my use of terminology. Uh, I may use service learning, community engagement, education for democracy, civic engagement, not all of those interchangeably, but I've come over the years to, to decide that while some people care uh, a little too much about what terminology is used and how we highlight it, um, I may use these interchangeably and uh, you certainly can challenge that at the end or question it, but I may go back and forth, uh, and I hope that I, I am understood. All right, so uh, let me get started. I want to uh, also um, recognize some influences. As I get older and as I think about these questions, I realize all of the people who have influenced me, and uh, and we, we've lost all three of them in this field. Uh, Herman's still alive and uh, doing great work. Uh, mainly in South Carolina, but for those of you who are new to the field, um, you may not have been influenced by these folks. Uh, Elizabeth Hollander, obviously, former president of Campus Compact. I can still her hear her talking about this work as being important because our democracy depends on it. She was a huge believer that uh, this work in community engagement, if it wasn't about political engagement and engagement in, in creating change in public life that it wasn't worth doing. Uh, my uh, personal mentor, uh, my dissertation advisor, uh, Benjamin Barber, who uh, died uh, last spring, uh, also was a huge influence, particularly during the 1990s when uh, the field moved toward a, an explicitly civic engagement emphasis. Um, and then uh, Herman Blake, who, um, um, I have so many phrases that he brought. Uh, he was a, uh, a teacher uh, uh, through some of the early Campus Compact Institutes and uh, a huge influence early on, at least for me, 
Um, and those are people that if you're new in the field and uh, haven't heard uh, much about them, uh, I would uh, urge you to look them up and I can give you references as well. All right, so I wanna, I wanna go back and give a sense of uh, what I think the story of engagement in higher education has been. It's a story many of you uh, may know, may tell, you may tell it a little differently than I do, but I think it's important to know where we've come from and where we've been. And I'll try to spend as little time as possible on this. But if we think about the campus compact history as part of the story of higher education engagement, and of course it goes back way before campus compact, I'll admit that. But when the three presidents and uh, Frank Newman got together and formed campus compact in 1985-86, uh, over 30 years ago, their focus was on engaging in community. Uh, and it was primarily the language was around community service. Um, the, at the time, there was uh, a concern about the so-called me generation, about excessive individualism, and community service was seen as an antidote to that. Uh, the student arm of this movement, the Campus Outreach Opportunities League, COOL, also formed about the same time and was attempt to respond to that as well. Uh, it's almost 30 years now that uh, President Edward Blaustein at Rutgers University gave a commencement address in which he argued for community service as a graduation requirement uh, as a way of defeating the shibboleths or the pathologies of excessive individualism on the one hand and uh, per the persistence of bigotry, discrimination, uh, um, racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, religious intolerance, uh, fear of foreigners, um, uh, class inequalities. Um, that was 1988, um, and we've come so far uh, since then. Uh, uh, it sounds familiar even today. Well, so that's the origin. Very quickly in, however, the language and the emphasis shifted because this is higher education and we are uh, about learning. And so the language of service learning really comes in by the late 18, uh, 1980s. Uh, there are conferences, best practice principles that get articulated to combine service with learning, an emphasis on institutionalizing uh, the work. Um, and um, I would say that there's a good decade there, late 80s to the late 90s, where service learning is the is the coin of the realm and this, this effort to mainstream, to, to make this institutionalized by focusing on the um, learning outcomes uh, of uh, doing work in communities. Then I think, uh, I think 1996 and beyond, we begin to see that uh, all of this, because there were assumptions that all of this work would inevitably lead people into participation in public life, that this would be education for democracy, that people would move from community engagement to political engagement. It just didn't happen. Um, the election of 1996 um, witnessed the lowest voter turnout in, in decades, uh, especially among traditionally aged uh, college students or, the, or people who were of the age of traditionally aged college students. A lot of reports came out talking about the uh, United States as a nation of spectators rather than participants. And there was a, a great hand wringing on the part of higher education and uh, a feeling that we needed to move toward explicitly political engagement as, the, uh, as what we needed to be about. Um, and so we we see in, at the beginning of the 21st century calls for increased attention to civic education and engagement, political engagement, some responses in higher education. And um, I would say after that, frustration and disappointment because again, it didn't happen. And we're still today thinking and talking about the need to move from community engagement to political engagement, at least some of us are. So, um, I want to say Campus Compact was one of the leading organizations trying to do this uh, and whoops. Uh, and um, in large part, it was in response to what we were hearing. Uh, I have a couple of quick quotes from uh, students. Um, 
they are not necessarily in this time frame, but they represent what was going on and, and why we were frustrated. Um, so we have this quote that represents uh, th that students are not interested in politics. They'd rather go help a kid read than, um, than be concerned about political engagement. And then uh, there's this classic quote uh, I've stolen from Bernadette Chi and Elaine knows the story um, of the senior who talked about uh, wanting children and grandchildren to work in homeless shelters. And uh, Bernadette asked, what is wrong with this picture? Uh, yes. And, um, and from college presidents, um, Derek Bach, uh, leaving Harvard University as president, uh, uh, had this classic uh, um, uh, tidbit here. So uh, in part in response to this, uh, we get uh, Campus Pomp Compact uh, producing the President's Declaration on the Civic Responsibility of Higher Education. Uh, again, Liz Hollander, Harry Boyd were key figures in, in drafting this. Um, um, 400 or 500 uh, college presidents signed on very quickly. And you see Campus Compact decided that yes, we need to renew our role as agents of democracy. Um, and a recognition that service by itself is not necessarily leading students to embrace the duties of active citizenship and civic participation. With this, I think we begin to see a change in language. Uh, many centers and, and units in campuses that were either community service centers or service learning centers began to change their names uh, or at least see civic engagement as a primary goal. And for a decade, at least, there was this effort to move in the direction of political and civic engagement. However, over that decade, um, a number of publications suggested that we weren't moving the needle, uh, beginning with uh, at the K-12 level, uh, the Civic Mission of Schools, a uh, publication that still, I think, uh, uh, rings true in terms of um, what uh, the K-12 schools are doing or not doing. In fact, probably rings more true than it did in 2003. Um, uh, in 2007, uh, the Kettering Foundation and uh, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement C Circle produced uh, a nice little volume called Millennials Talk Politics. It was actually a redo of something Kettering had done in the 1990s, a really nice volume worth looking at, but again, suggesting that universities, when they were providing levels of opportunity for civic participation and learning, it was unequal and uneven. Uh, the same year, um, uh, the fruition of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teachings um, Political Engagement Project uh, produced a volume uh, that uh, Ann Colby and uh, Liz Beaumont and Tom Ehrlich uh, produced, a really great piece, uh, suggesting that we're not paying enough attention in higher education to political engagement outcomes. And then finally, all this culminates in 2012 with uh, a crucible moment. Hard to believe that that's six years ago. Um, but a uh, crucible moment um, recognized that, um, that we're not really achieving what we want to achieve because uh, maybe the academy uh, is not well positioned to produce a civic engagement agenda. So these documents all suggest that we're um, not moving the needle. So I want to look at where we are today and raise the questions for today. Um, as a political scientist, I start with uh, electoral participation. A lot of people would challenge that and suggest <clears throat> that, um, that voting is not a good measure of political engagement. Uh, but I think the fact remains that it is the lowest common denominator form of engagement. If you're not voting, you're not likely to be engaged in other forms of, uh, that we might call political engagement or policy work or advocacy work. So in 2016, depending on how you count the voting eligible population, about 60% of those eligible to vote voted. That's more than voted in 2012, but less than 2008. We've been hovering around this uh, high 50% uh, range for some time now. 
Um, and now we have the benefit of the, um, the INSELV uh, college uh, student voting rate results, the work of Nancy Thomas uh, at the Institute for Democracy and Higher Education at Tufts University. Uh, a lot of schools now have joined uh, this national study. And uh, we can actually see how, what, how our college student voting rates look nationally as well as on your own campus. And if you haven't joined, if your institution hasn't joined, I really urge you to do that. It's free, um, you get some great data and uh, as well as a lot of other resources. So um, in um, 2012, which is the first year that, that INSELV really measured this, um, and this is students in college, the overall rate was 47%. Um, two years later in an off-year election, which uh, where participation tends to be a lot lower, particularly among college students, a paltry 19%. And then in 2016, um, the voting rate went up, but since voter registration rates were also up, um, the actual voting rate of registered students, I would argue, was down. And um, not a robust, um, electoral participation. If we look at broader questions uh, of our political uh, system, we, you all know about the complaints about partisan polarization. I've uh, just anecdotally heard students really dissatisfied in a way that I haven't heard before with our two-party system, with politics as it's practiced, especially at the national level. We've got um, the persistence of inequity um, um, and, um, and discrimination, inequality, and at the same time, a backlash against efforts to address uh, inequities um, uh, and, and efforts to increase inclusion and diversity. Um, I am really uh, struck by this issue of how we know what we know about politics. Uh, the segmentation of our political information, the fact that people are only listening and, and, and viewing information that, that aligns with their own uh, viewpoints, uh, the arguments about whether, whether news is fake and whether our facts are really facts is really disturbing. Uh, and for citizens and our students, um, how they know what they know about politics matters. Um, this has led uh, Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein in a recently published book with E.J. Dion uh, to argue that we are facing the greatest crisis in our democracy since the Civil War. That's uh, pretty disturbing. Um, last month, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education, a little section, uh, I think they called it Civics 101, and they talked about what's going on on college campuses. Uh, the same Nancy Thomas that I referenced earlier um, was quoted as, um, as saying that, you know, we, we may end up on the wrong side of history and that we really are not um, producing the kind of political education that our campuses need to produce. Um, and that leads to two questions that the Chronicle raised. Um, should we be offering more than service learning opportunities to get students politically involved? Uh, I think that's a rhetorical question, uh, but the bigger question is, can uh, this work in community engagement and service learning on its own, uh, even intentionally done, well done, create socially and politically aware students? Well, let's see if we can answer that question. A few years ago, I wrote a piece in uh, the Higher Education Exchange, a, a publication of the Kettering Foundation, and I, I suggested that uh, a lot of the disappointment with our field has to do with uh, three problems that are endemic to the field. Um, first of all, I think that one of the problems with our field is that we don't really pay attention to the democratic purposes of engagement work. Uh, most programs that I see on college campuses uh, tend to be very thin in their conceptual notions of engagement and democracy. So one of the answers as to why we're not doing better and moving the needle in the area of civic engagement or political engagement is that our programs just don't have that as their primary aim. Um, 
part of the, the, what has happened with institutionalization is in trying to build uh, community engagement on our campuses and trying to connect it to the curriculum, we've wanted to invite everybody in. We want to do engagement across the curriculum. And uh, that's not, it's not an easy thing to connect that to political engagement. As a political scientist, that matters to me, but a lot of my political science colleague, uh, colleagues don't think that civic engagement or political engagement is what they want to do. They want to do the science of politics. And so you can imagine that a biologist or an engineer or someone in business administration or the visual or performing arts or in foreign language studies that to ask someone to do engagement work in the first place, to do partnership work with communities is a, a big enough stretch as it, as it is. But then to ask them to connect that to democratic purposes, to, to notions about civic education, education for, of citizens in a democracy is something that many faculty and others on our campuses, other educators just aren't equipped to do, aren't inclined to do, it doesn't tie to their own notion of themselves as teachers or scholars. And so as a result, most of our programs end up being quite thin in how they've conceptualized um, civic engagement, democracy, how they connect uh, community engagement with those notions, if they do at all. Um, there's, there's a weak theories of change. If, if, if we're using logic models, one of the impact areas is not seen as education for democracy. So we have a problem of purpose. We also have a problem of time. Most higher education interventions, if you will, or programs operate uh, at best as one time, one semester, one course interventions. To the extent that again, we've tried to institutionalize and do civic engagement across the curriculum. This is often done, at least from the student's point of view, as one course. Uh, it may be a course that is in the major, often not. It may be a course in the first year as part of a first year seminar program. Um, and um, it's just hard to develop civic capacities, to develop civic knowledge, uh, skills, uh, values, and attitudes in a one course, one semester uh, uh, time frame. Um, we may, you know, in, in the United States, the 14th Amendment guarantees the people born in the United States are born citizens, but, um, but, and you can, legally, but uh, you don't become an effective citizen by birth. You don't become an effective citizen uh, by a one and done uh, course. Even the best design courses uh, in, in higher education are not going to be able to develop the kinds of skills and values and knowledge base and the ability to confront the kinds of public problems that citizens need to confront. And this is especially true when that civic intervention is done not connected to a student's major or career aspirations. If I'm uh, studying management and I'm taking a course maybe my first year or a course that's a general education course, that has a community engagement component, even designed toward civic education. Um, if I don't see it connected to my career aspirations, to my identity as a manager or an engineer or whatever it is I see as my primary identity, I think it's hard to connect one's citizenship to what one sees as future work or whatever identity um, you want to maintain. So there's a problem of time. And I think it's a serious problem and it's, it's hard to overcome because of the way we've structured our, uh, our work and tried to institutionalize it. And then finally, I think we have a problem of, of uh, what I call a prob problem of accountability. Um, at the one hand, we're not really thinking about what our graduates should be prepared to do concerning their civic identities and, and civic skills. Um, and then we don't do a very good job of thinking about how we evaluate it. Um, we do a good job of counting 
we can um, count the number of hours served and uh, we can even uh, translate that into dollars, which our institutions love to see because then they can say what their contribution to the community has been through student service learning or community engagement work. Um, there are a lot of pre post surveys that are done, uh, but we really don't think about what happens at the end of a college career and then beyond. We don't really think longitudinally whether our programs are really achieving uh, what we hope to achieve with respect to education for citizenship five years after a student has graduated, 10 years, 15, 20. And that's really hard to do, but we're not really doing it very well. All right, so how do we deal with these problems? Um, I think we can address these problems. First, we have to address the problem of purpose by articulating core outcomes. One of the things that um, uh, a crucible moment did was it came up with a, a, a framework for 21st century um, uh, citizenship. Um, the framework is uh, exhaustive and a, a little bit ambitious, but it provides a framework of what we're talking about when we're thinking about knowledge and attitudes and skills that citizens in a democracy and a diverse pluralistic democracy need to have. Um, whatever we do, we need to articulate what our core outcomes are with respect to political and civic engagement. We need to think uh, about time differently as well. I think we need to think about sustained developmental programs. Uh, and there's been uh, an emergence of minors, uh, certificates, uh, an effort to do civic learning in the major or create engaged departments. Uh, the AAC and U's peer review has a new uh, issue out about civic learning in the major with some case examples of what's going on in different programs around the country, which I'd recommend to all of you. Uh, but however we do it, we need to think about this problem of time and think about how we can build upon um, courses and co-curricular efforts to build a sustainable developmental program so that one's civic identity matters and it's connected to other identities that our students have. And then finally, I think we need to do more longitudinally. Um, uh, one of the things I'm very proud of is that uh, our own program here at Providence College, which is a interdisciplinary major uh, and minor in public and community service studies, we have looked at our graduates in combination with a couple of other programs that like ours is sustained and developmental. And we've generated data uh, through both quantitative and qualitative data. And I'll talk about this uh, briefly at, at the end uh, of this um, presentation um, to give you a sense of what we've found. Um, but we need to do more of that and we need to share and uh, uh, and disseminate what we're learning um, across the field. So uh, the question is, are there signs of hope? Um, some would say, given what I've just uh, presented, maybe we should give up on community engagement as maybe it's not even a vehicle, let alone the most effective vehicle to uh, move us toward political engagement. Uh, one of the things I just saw in this uh, AAC and U publication was a reference to uh, the President's Commission on Higher Education some 70 years ago. And you'll see that 70 years ago, uh, this presidential commission was arguing that, um, that the first thing that higher education ought to do is produce, be the carrier of democratic values, ideals, and process. And it has three goals related to this. And uh, to think about this as a charge for higher education 70 years ago is a little bit uh, depressing that we have not moved the needle in 70 years, let alone 30 years um, uh, since Campus Compact's been doing this work. But I would say that we can't abandon hope. I still am hopeful and, and there's some reasons for that. First of all, I think that there are things that service learning that are at the foundation of service learning or, or community engagement that are also at the foundation of good democratic political education. Um, I do hold out hope because um, community engagement, 
flips this expert knower um, relationship that we have in uh, higher education that it is both the community and the student who is having the experience in the community who becomes the expert and allows for a much more democratic uh, pedagogy and epistemology. Um, I believe that Tania Mitchell is absolutely right when she talks about critical service learning and that, that 2008 Michigan Journal article that service learning done critically and well redistributes power not only between higher education and the communities that we work with but also in the classroom between teacher and student that has democratic implications so i don't want to give up hope because of that secondly i think that community engagement uh, creates authentic relationships and in a democracy especially at the local level um, as I quote David Matthews, I think we define uh, ourselves by what we do with other citizens, what we do with other uh, individuals in our community, and that um, service learning and community engagement shares this sentiment that um, it is interacting between people and understanding how people formulate problems, identify problems, and begin to move towards solutions. That, uh, that both community engagement and uh, participatory democratic activity share. I believe very strongly that um, critical reflection um, and eloquent listening ought to be both part of community engagement and they're essential parts of, of good democratic civic education. Um, the term eloquent listening is something that I first heard Herman Blake use referencing uh, um, a phrase in Langston Hughes' uh, Simple series, um, Jesse Simple series. And uh, I think that we talk about deliberation a lot, but part of the power of deliberative dialogue is the power that comes from listening to one another. Um, and in our engagement work, we need to be listening uh, not only to students, but to, uh, to our community partners and to uh, the populations that we serve in our communities. Then finally, I think that there's uh, that, that we have theoretical foundations in pragmatism, uh, not only in John Dewey, but other of the pragmatists that, that, that are both connected to service learning and to democratic theory and practice. So for those reasons, as well as others, I don't think we should give up hope. Um, Campus Compact entered the fray once again uh, about a year and a half ago uh, when it uh, issued an action statement. I think the action statement is eloquent. It focuses on these questions around democracy and revitalizing our democracy and revitalizing political engagement. Um, not only that, I think uh, not only does co the Compact want us to focus on these action statements related to political engagement, but uh, the, those presidents who have signed uh, the statement are committing their campuses to an action plan and a process of developing a plan of action to move toward the goals uh, stated in the anniversary action statement. Um, and so I have some hope uh, around that. I've seen some of the action statements that universities have come up with, um, and uh, they're, they're they're um, ambitious and, uh, and strong. Uh, whether we realize those or not, uh, I think that's really a sign of hope. Um, I'm also hopeful because of what's going on, uh, on um, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you may have heard that the Oxford English Dictionary chose for its word uh, of the year of 2017, the word youthquake, which I hadn't even heard that term used, um, but it comes out of the significant increase that occurred in the summer 2017 general election in the United, United Kingdom. For years, youth engagement in politics in the UK had been uh, going the direction that it had in the United States, uh, and um, there was a significant increase, a, a huge increase, unexpected increase, and uh, and that offers signs of hope, uh, if only um, it, because there were candidates or uh, that were speaking 
to uh, the concerns and the goals and ambitions of young people. And maybe we can see some hope if that happens in this country. Then finally, I think there's signs of hope that come out of this study that I, that I told you about, that we did the three institution study of the graduates of, of um, sustained developmental uh, programs um, on three campuses, um, Stanford, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and Providence College. First of all, uh, we, uh, in, through our uh, quantitative survey that we did in 2012, we had some fairly robust um, voting rates among the graduates, uh, all self-reported, um, uh, no doubt, but, uh, but um, still robust. Uh, and and uh, so the fact that these programs that had civic uh, engagement outcomes, political engagement outcomes, as part of the goals of the programs, and that graduates five and 10 and 15 years after they graduated were reporting very high levels of, of at least electoral participation is something. Um, uh, we also asked a question with um, a number of about 21 different items asking these graduates whether in the past year they had done the following, uh, discussed political issues with friends, uh, volunteered, uh, boycotted or boycotted products, uh, and you can see the different uh, things. E even confronted jokes, joke statements or innuendos that uh, did a service to a particular population. And again, um, we saw fairly robust rates of, of action in these areas as well. In addition to the quantitative survey, um, which has a mountain of data that we developed out of it. We did interviews with a, a random, um, a stratified random sample uh, from each of the programs. And then we followed up after we had done the interviews and done a preliminary analysis and did focus groups uh, with graduates from the three institutions to ask them to help us interpret the data. And uh, we, learned a lot in these, uh, these interviews and focus groups about what civic and political identity looks like and what the barriers might be to fairly recent graduates to participating in um, the communities of which they found themselves a part. Um, what we found was that these graduates spoke a lot about local, uh, local participation, that they weren't focused as much on national politics, uh, on, on, on presidential campaigns, but more focused on local action. And the local action took so many different uh, forms uh, when we talked to uh, graduates. They talked about civic action and politics in the workplace, how they could do things that would advance um, uh, the solving of problems in the workplace and saw uh, the potential for civic action where they were working, uh, whether it was in a hospital or a school or in interaction with uh, their, wor their workmates. Um, we also heard really powerful um, um, articulation of the role that critical reflection, which was a key component of all of these programs, how that played out in their lives after they graduated and how that connected to understandings of themselves as civic actors, as citizens. Um, and so it kind of reinforced what, what those of us who were part of this study thought about the role of critical reflection in uh, civic and political identity and engagement. And then finally, uh, and I'm borrowing a term that I, uh, that I uh, got from uh, uh, Rowdy Hildreth and his colleagues uh, when Rowdy was at the University of Minnesota, um, doing a study of uh, various youth work, um, that civic action was in many of these graduates uh, a way of life for, uh, for, our, uh, for the alums of these three programs. Uh, I like the term civic vocation. The idea that for these graduates, they felt called to, called by a problem in the public realm, by a crisis in the public realm, to uh, act in the same way that uh, we think about a religious calling in the, in the kind of historical or traditional sense. 
Uh, and I've, I've uh, lifted a quote from uh, Jim Wallace's baccalaureate address uh, from Stanford University, something that I've often used with, with seniors as well, that, that there was a powerful sense that um, that is important to think about making a difference in the world and that the world, the world's problems can call us to act in particular ways. And, and we saw this in our graduates. And, and in all of that, um, I think there is hope uh, in what are arguably very difficult times. Um, just as a personal note, uh, before I close and ask for questions, um, at, right after the 2016 election, um, a few of us here at, at the Feinstein Institute received a, a note of, from a, a graduate uh, who had been out for a few years from having graduated. And uh, she uh, reported that, um, that while there, was, there may have been reason for despair after the election, she felt that the education that she'd been provided gave her the tools to continue to try to make a difference and make change, that she had tools around organizing, around identifying problems, around working with others uh, with, from diverse backgrounds and with diverse ideas. And she told us, you know, don't despair, uh, keep teaching and teaching hard and teach like hell, she said, because it matters and, uh, and uh, these tools are things that we can carry with us uh, even in times of despair. So I still have hope. Uh, I am uh, somewhat cynical from time to time, but I have hope and uh, hope all of you do too. And uh, wanna uh, thank everyone for listening and see if there are questions or comments or challenges or critiques that people wanna take up. Thanks so much, Rick. That was really great. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. A couple of logistical ones. There's some folks who really liked some of the quotes you had and they wanted to know if you would be willing to share your PowerPoint Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So after this, you can email your latest version to Piper. And when we send out the eval and the link to YouTube, I did say that people can watch this video. Uh, it's recorded, so they can also look at it again that way. Um, the other question, sort of logistical, is, is would you also, is that study that you guys did, is that something that's been published? Is it, how can people find that study and its results? There are pieces that have been published and uh, probably the most prominent of which is a 2015 Michigan Journal article that really specifically looked at the role of reflection uh, after college. Uh, and again, it's, it's uh, Colleen Raspanek, Tania Mitchell, uh, and myself, and a couple of other uh, contributors that wrote this piece. So it wasn't, I'm not the, by far, not the only person involved. Colleen and Tania are doing uh, ongoing work and we're hoping that some things will be uh, published out of it in the future. Uh, Tania and I are writing a piece for diversity and democracy um, that is uh, part of, a, uh, of an issue that's going to look at what happens to alums uh, um, after graduation in programs and at at colleges and universities that really care about civic action and engagement. And so that's probably going to be coming out sometime this year as well. But I, I, can, uh, I can send a, a, a copy of a PDF that comes out of the Michigan Journal piece if people are interested. Yeah, that would be great if you can also, yeah, send um, some of those links to Piper. Someone is asking if they could replicate the study. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't see why not. We, ha I, I think we can, I need to talk to uh, Tania and Colleen in particular and see, I don't think there's anything proprietary, but uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think we want to encourage not just replication, but people can look at the instruments and the, and the uh, interview protocols and focus group protocols we used and adapt them to their own purposes. Yeah, the... I think the survey we used is probably way too long for most people. The interview protocol, these interviews were an, on average an hour each and people might want to shorten those down. But um, I think that uh, this is the kind of field that uh, we need to be stealing from each other and, and being resources to each other. So 
uh, I'll check in with the with the two of them, but I don't see why uh, it couldn't that our our tools couldn't be used. Okay, great. And you are providing your email address here, so people yep. can email you directly if they're back, interested in that. Back in touch with you if you want to ask any questions. Yeah, about any of that stuff. Okay, so I'll move on to a few other questions. And a reminder to folks: if you have questions, please ask them in the Q and A box. I will get to the chats in a second and. Rowdy has a couple questions, but I'm going to start first in order of folks asking. Um, so this, the, a couple of these questions came in pretty early in your presentation. Um, Zara from uh, UC Irvine asked, what are your thoughts regarding how we define political engagement and the pros and cons of defining it more broadly? I'm curious about the ways that youth and others attempt to engage the political system outside of the more traditional forms, which include campaign contributions, voting, writing letters, et cetera? Yeah, I, that's a really great question. I think it's a really important point. I think that, um, that um, younger generations who tend to define uh, political engagement in, a, in, a, in different ways that we need to listen to them. I think that we need to listen to voices of, of young people about how they're defining their engagement in politics, in public life, and that that ought to go into how we think about what our outcomes ought to be for our students. So I think that, I don't know that broadly is, is the right term, but I think we need to define what we mean by engagement simply, but in a way that can, um, um, can uh, be useful given the way that, that particularly younger people see engagement in, in, in our public life so that it isn't just defined or even primarily defined um, around particular acts like voting or writing or um, working in a campaign or things like that. I think that we ought to be thinking about um, certain skill sets that are important to uh, participating in a democracy. There are certain ways of thinking about knowledge. I think that, um, that issues of voice and listening and reflection, critical reflection, are important as part of a liberal education as well as part of a democratic education. Uh, one of the problems I had with a crucible moment is that there were just too many things in that list. And, to, and I think there were 31 elements of their framework for 21st century civic learning. And to think that we can uh, try to achieve all of those or even a, a part of those. But I think that if it, it helps if we can come to some kind of agreement about what those baseline things ought to be and begin to think about how do we operationalize those and how do we put those into our programs as goals and outcomes? Okay. I don't know if that answered the question. But. <laughs> um, so this is from Rowdy at CU Boulder, who you mentioned in the, um, in the study. Um, All right. Yeah, he's saying hello to you too. Uh, so he, there's a couple questions. I'm going to go with the one he asked first. Uh, I too have heard anecdotal stories of alienation from the two-party system. I also have seen incredible energy among students towards engagement. Do you have any sense of recent studies that can make sense of this twofold phenomena of alienation and activism? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, well, that's where I, that's why I wanted to reference the UK because I uh, what I saw in what happened was that when you had at least one candidate who was addressing issues that mattered to young people and addressing issues kind of outside the mainstream of the party system in the UK, young people responded uh, because I think um, um, Jeremy Corbyn was, uh, for whatever we think about his ideology, he was addressing issues that mattered to young people uh, around higher education, affordability and accessibility, as well as issues of inequality uh, that mattered to young people. And I, I think that um, Jim Hightower, who used to be an elected official in, in uh, Texas, uh, said if the gods wanted us to vote, uh, they would have given us candidates. And part of the problem with our political system is that, that our 
candidates and our campaigns are aimed at people who vote, who tend to be older, and they're really not addressing the things that young people care about. And young people want to make a difference. They have things that concern them, uh, a whole range of things, and our campaigns and our two parties really aren't addressing those issues. And when they do, I think people, res I think young people and, and a lot of citizens respond. And, and that's what's so frustrating. So that, I don't know if that explains the, the twofold nature of it, but I'm seeing on this campus, a lot of students get very involved in, uh, in achieving change on campus. They see things that are wrong on campus they want to address, and they want to have a voice in those things, and they are quite activists around issues, uh, whether it be racial equity or uh, housing problem, you know, housing uh, and voice in housing issues on campus. And so, I think it's a lot of it's a matter of having a public that responds to what people care about and having an avenue for what people care about to be addressed in the public realm. Um, and I think our two party system just isn't doing that. At least for the, the aged students, the traditionally aged college students that, that I see. Okay. Um, the other question from Rowdy, um, let's see, how, okay, so you talked about the challenge of time. You mentioned majors, minors, and certificate programs as possible avenues to address the question from the perspective of students. Um, he'd like to think about this question from the perspective of community partners. So I don't know if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah, I, and I think that goes hand in hand. I think that if you have something that's more sustainable over time, it is more likely that students who are working with a partner over time or working on an issue that doesn't, you know, part of the problem of time is that community problems aren't uh, one semester, aren't addressed in a semester. They uh, expand, they, they span a, a longer period of time. And so if there are ways that we can think about our curricula and our co-curriculum uh, in ways that students can get involved and continue to be involved and to be involved at a higher level as they go through over time, it is more likely that the relationships are going to develop with community partners and the kind of mutuality and reciprocity that can only develop over time. And after all, a lot of our community partners distrust the involvement of us as institutions and our students. And that trust can only be built over time that if we have that kind of uh, over the course of several terms or semesters or years, it is more likely that students are going to learn from the wisdom of our communities. They're going to develop relationships. They're going to have mentors in the community, uh, as well as actually be a resource to communities in trying to tackle the problems that, that our communities are, are concerned about and therefore we ought to be concerned about. Uh, I'm struck by the, 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 the fact that we have a lot of students who go through the four years of our major and minor who aren't from Providence and they stay here because they've developed relationships, they develop networks, they develop references, and they continue to work and they, they're compelled by the kind of work that they get to do. But that only happens over time. So I think from the perspective of partnerships that the time is even more important. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, a few more questions have come in. I think we'll probably take these last three or four and then stop at that since we only have about 10 or so more minutes. Um, do you have any suggestions, this is from Monique Ellison, do you have any suggestions on how to help students and campuses move from focusing solely on volunteering to focusing on political engagement? Well, big uh, question. <laughs> it's kind of long. It's a big question. Well, I, I think that that really has to do with how we think intentionally about the the whatever toolbox we have on our campus, and that differs from campus to campus. So, if we're talking about incorporating community engagement into the curriculum, I think we can think about the ways in which the curriculum can be a way to harvest 
work in communities, relationships that are developed through service or volunteering that can then uh, allow students to think about root causes, the, the root causes uh, and the public policy issues that lead to the need for service and volunteering in the first place, can uh, develop ways that students can, can, I don't want to say convert, but how volunteering and volunteer work in the community can be vehicles to thinking about public problems, public problem solving, um, and think about the more overt political issues that arise out of the relationships that are being developed, the problems that are being addressed. Um, so that's, that's the way I would answer it. And I think there are a lot of different tools that can be used. There are uh, additional resources and materials that can be used in a classroom. If the course is tied to particular disciplinary uh, um, so disciplinary departments, there are disciplinary lenses that can have more overtly political uh, ways of thinking about things or ways that a person within a discipline can approach questions of civic education and democracy and, and politics. So I think it's a matter of bringing what we can bring as educators to bear on the experience of volunteering or doing community service or doing community-based research whatever form that community experience takes and thinking intentionally about how we transform that experience into learning about public life and politics. And that I think can have many forms depending on where you are, what your institution allows and uh, who you're working with. Great, okay. Uh, last few questions. Uh, you have a quote about how we're so worried about appearing partisan. Findings in my field do tend to support more progressive policies, but they come from rigorous research. How do I keep students from shutting down when I introduce ideas that may challenge how they see the world, particularly in this time of heightened political conflict? That's a great question. And I, th I think that's a question that all, all of us have to pay attention to. Um, I think that this whole field um, has been concerned about how it's perceived uh, as being perceived as more progressive, as more left leaning. And I think one answer to that is to say that the kinds of research and the kinds of scholarly work that we can bring to bear on working communities uh, will make a student more effective regardless of what uh, ideological bent they have and what their approach is to a particular problem. And that I think that uh, wherever students want to end up, that they're going to be more effective if they learn the skills and the knowledge base and the tools that they need to confront the problems that they care about. Uh, we have a course in community organizing that we offer. And um, when it was first put forth as a permanent course, uh, uh, the dean of our college asked if, oh, this is, this is a leftist course, is it not? And, and my argument was that the tools of organizing can be used by people who are on the right or the left, and it makes a person a more effective citizen. And so if, we, if our education for democracy is aimed at skill bases, at critical thinking, at the development of knowledge bases that can be used, by whoever uh, wants to use them, that, th that we can be more uh, multi-partisan, if you will, uh, not necessarily nonpartisan. So that, that's one answer. I think the other answer is that uh, this, this work around political engagement is inevitably going to be accused of being on the left because ultimately uh, democracy is about being on the side of the people. And the work that we're doing in communities is to address issues that have not been addressed by the political system. That, and so I think we have a tradition that puts us on a particular side and I think we have to be honest about it. Uh, I don't know that that will, that will solve the problem of students shutting down, but I think we have to be honest about what side we're on. And ultimately, we've, if we bring more younger people out to vote, we know what that may mean in terms of political outcomes. Um, but I do think that we can make an argument that this will make citizens more effective regardless of where 
they want to be and what their their ideologies are, what their identities are, and what goals they want to pursue. Okay. Last two questions. Um, this one is relating back to the research study. How do we support faculty in conducting this kind of research with their alumni? Well, um, I think providing the kind, I mean, providing, uh, it, it takes a lot and it requires resources to be able to do this work. First of all, you have to have an institution that's committed to maintaining contact with alums. One of the first things we had to do, and it took us about a year, maybe even more than a year, was make sure that we had a solid list of uh, contact information for all of our alums who were part of these programs. And if you want to do a comparison group, you have to be able to come up with a, a, um, a, a control group or comparison group. You have to have an institution that's committed to um, to maintaining contact with alums. Um, so that's one thing I think that um, uh, providing resources that faculty might need to conduct this research, whether it be uh, resources to to produce surveys to help analyze and and um, and enter data um, to to help with um, transcription and the like, all of the kind of resources you need to be able to 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 do this work, to develop the data, and then to analyze it. Um, uh, though that's the role of administrators and other units. But and I think the other thing is that it has to be rewarded. Uh, if faculty do this research and they do it rigorously, they have to understand that they won't be punished at least by doing this kind of research rather than research that may be seen as more appropriate to their disciplinary department. So uh, research on um, the scholarship of teaching and learning has to be valued by the institution that you're at. And if it isn't, it's hard to convince faculty and other scholars to do the work. Uh, fortunately, um, that is valued at, at, um, at my institution, but a lot of institutions um, colleagues can be discouraged if they're probationary or if they are looking to be tenured or promoted and and it's not valued by their departments or by the the college or university as a whole so I think those are the ways in which we can support it and I think and sharing information about this work being done on different campuses so our uh, interest in sharing what we've done and how we've done it uh, hopefully could be a resource to other people on other campuses Great. Okay, so this is our last question. It has a little bit of a long lead up because it has a little bit of comments in, <laughs> tied in. So Jeremy says, thank you for your presentation. I agree with much of it. A couple of things. I think tenure and promotion guidelines are key, despite the legitimate critique, are the downside of institutionalization. If civic learning is recognized there, it incentivizes faculty to design a deeper civic pedagogy. Second, living learning communities is another high impact practice that if it connects courses and service learning projects over multiple semesters has great potential. Third, and this I think gets to the question, third, a more macro point, we need to get organized at all levels to fight voter suppression and gerrymandering and also push for more voting by mail or making election day a national holiday. We have tremendous structural barriers for all citizens, regardless of age. For me, part of college students' low voter participation relates to these barriers. So the question is, what specific ways do you see for higher ed to intervene and gain leverage to remove these state and nationwide structural barriers to voting? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'd like to hope that, um, that our expertise in higher ed, that our scholarship um, and our research work can demonstrate that these uh, methods of suppression, that the, that the things that are barriers to uh, registration, to participation in public life, that we need to remove them and that, that we can be a voice for, that calls for that removal. Um, I know that there are more and more folks in the philanthropic sector and the nonprofit sector that are working on advocating for this. I think that higher education should advocate on behalf of, of our students that, that there ought to be, uh, for example, easier ways for our students to register to vote and to vote in the places that they want, whether that's uh, in their home location or on campus 
there are a lot of efforts to suppress uh, student vote that, that really uh, we ought to be advocating against. Um, and so I, th I think that we can lend our voice uh, to the extent that we have that kind of uh, intellectual power uh, toward trying to dismantle all of these ways in which uh, our participation and the, and the participation of our students is being prevented or, or where there are barriers and obstacles to that. So I agree completely. And I think that we ought to be a voice for that. We ought to advocate for that. And I, don't, I, I think that, um, you know, there might be consequences, but I think we ought to be doing that. That's part of our service, actually, um, and ought to be recognized as such. Right. Thank and I just say one other thing about uh, promotion and tenure. I think there's been some movement on that. I, uh, Imagining America several years ago did, has done great work uh, in this area of trying to articulate ways in which engagement in teaching and in scholarship as well as in service can be recognized, can be built into tenure and promotion guidelines. And I think there's been some movement uh, uh, across the nation, not as much as I would like, but there's been movement and people recognizing that this is important. And, and, uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of younger scholars who want to do this work and they're pushing uh, institutions to recognize it because they want to do it. Um, and they're not willing to abide by the old rules of the game until they get tenure, until they get to be full professors. They want to do it now, and they want to be recognized for it because it's legitimate scholarship, it's legitimate uh, pedagogy, and ought to be recognized. So I'm really hopeful that younger scholars are pushing this, and they're pushing the envelope in, in ways that I hope our institutions respond to. Well, and as the faculty slowly retire, this new generation of faculty are rising into the full tenured and they're on the committees and whatnot for it. So we'll see that. Yeah, hopefully change will occur. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Rick. Um, and thank you to all the participants who are on. Um, it was a wonderful webinar. Rick, we'll close down the webinar and stop the recording, but if you can stay on, Rick, for just a minute. But thank you all. As I said, you'll get an evaluation and um, we'll have Rick's PowerPoint and um, the evaluation and the link to the YouTube channel coming out to you in the next couple days. So watch for an email on that. Bye everyone.